Hi, welcome back. I'm James Blackman from Enterprise IoT Insights. Uh, we have a session now on digital twins and really digital twins uh, and private networks. Uh, the focus is on manufacturing, of course, as it has been all day, but we will cover a range of vertical sectors here. Um, and the way the next 45 minutes will work is we have two 15 minute, minute presentations followed by a 15 minute panel discussion with both presenters when we will take questions from, from the audience, from you guys uh, as well. Um, so please ask questions as we go and we will get to them at the end. The two presentations are from Dan Isaac, CTO at Digital Twin Consortium and Simon Frumpkin, CEO at Freshwave Group. Uh, Dan is gonna present a range of use cases for digital tw twins and Simon has a case study about a digital twin on a private network at London St Pancras train station. So I'm going to hand over to Dan to take us through the first of those. Um, and we'll catch up with Simon in 15 and be all together again in, in 30 minutes or so to take questions. Right, so I'm gonna switch my camera off uh, and ask Dan if he can switch his on and also uh, share his screen. Dan, nice to have you with us. Thank you. Yeah, let me go ahead and uh, and get my screen shared here. Uh, camera's on, but also in the interest of uh, a bandwidth preservation, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'll go through the presentation uh, with the video off, and then we can go and uh, jump back into that. So with that said, let me go ahead and share my screen. You will see one coming up here first, and then we will get the full screen there. You should be able to see full screen now. That's great. We got you, Dan. We got you. Brilliant. Excellent. All right. Thank you. All right. So again, um, uh, thanks for this opportunity. My name is Dan Isaacs. I'm the CTO for the Digital Twin Consortium, and we're going to walk through some cases here, uh, exemplary, as we move forward. There we go. But I wanted to just highlight, you know, we're, we're really in this case where data is the lifeblood of the digital twin. And you can see here the amount of data that we're dealing with, uh, where we're looking at hyper-connected, hyper-distributed, hyper-speed, obviously with 5G, and then going through in some of the key areas, some of the key drivers. And, and the other part of this is really moving towards that hyper-automated uh, side. And what I wanted to show here was, uh, this is from IoT Analytics. You can see the emerging IoT technologies here. You can see Digital Twins is, they've labeled it as coming up, but it is in its, in its stages where it's moving forward into that nearing, uh, nearing maturity. I mean, this is one of the projections. It depends really, as we've seen the evolution of Digital Twins going across from having its origination in the aerospace and the manufacturing even uh, looking at that across from the value that's being provided through automotive, but it's really accelerating across every major industry. And, and we're seeing this really um, continuing as digital twins and all the enabling technologies are really converging and being able to bring this forward. And as a result, the Digital Twin Consortium was formed about two and a half years ago. And the original founders were actually Microsoft, Dell, ANSYS and Lendlease. And we've continued to build out our steering committee here across these different areas. So you can see Johnson Controls coming in. You can see General Electric, uh, GE Digital coming in, North Grumman. So we continue to build out as we see these. And we're actually going to be announcing a major oil and gas um, company coming in um, in, the next, uh, in the next coming months. So we continue to build that out. We continue to see the value that digital twins are, are providing across virtually every industry. And the, the unique thing about this consortium is it's, it's not just about the technology providers or the researchers that we bring in. Very key, we bring in academia. We bring in local government. Many of the mandates come through that. And also uh, the, the end users. But we don't stop there from our regional areas where there are either dialect challenges, time zone challenges, or just interest levels 
for joining a larger consortium, we create regional branch organizers. And so our regional branch organizers are members that have very close affiliation and association with academia, with the local government, with incubators and accelerators. In fact, several of our members have come out of either universities or those areas and being very successful in driving that forward. One of our regional branch organizers uh, in the UK uh, Slingshot Simulations hosted our last member meeting, and we had uh, lots of uh, great interactions in those areas, but it opens up the doors in those specific regions. And you can see here, um, we just had a, a webinar by Vancouver Airport that came in from our regional branch organizer in Canada, uh, Thinkly. And so we see this development throughout the world. So by the end of this year, we will be, we're on track to having a regional branch organizer in every major continent of the world. But again, we don't stop there. We now have associations with over 20 liaison consortiums, associations, uh, other groups, organizations where we can now build out and extend further the ecosystem of digital twin and enabling technologies. And you can see here across the board, whether it's in the manufacturing space with the uh, smart man, uh, SESME, Clean Energy Manufacturing Institute, uh, whether it's uh, MXD USA, Center of Excellence for Manufacturing here in the US, or whether it's the Industrial Digital Twin Association, or even within our own umbrella of object management group, which brings in six other consortiums that are able to create joint working groups and collaborate between those, in this case, the Industry IoT Consortium. So you can see here, this, this consortium really has ties around the world, as well as organizations throughout, so we can extend and really drive not just the awareness, but the adoption of digital twins and enabling technology. Here you can see focused areas, interoperability, critical, how do we accelerate the market? How do we provide the collective best practices together to help requirements for standards? We're not a standards organization, but we certainly work with those uh, major standards bodies, including the uh, object management group, SDO, which was responsible, is responsible for SysML, UML, and all the uh, several other uh, standards going through in many, many different uh, uh, market segments. But it's really about demonstrating the value so as I said, not a standards body, but we have this umbrella and we work together with different organizations, even within the consortium for interoperability working group, open source standards requirements and uh, platform stack. One of our subgroups, we're going to be releasing a white paper in that area. So quite a bit of um, areas that we cover and we're really driving that adoption throughout this build out of the ecosystem. And as you saw, many of the different working groups many of the different areas, we have now grown from the original four working groups, which are there starred. In fact, the capabilities and technologies was originally a terminology and taxonomy working group. And now we brought that forward in terms of the capabilities that we're looking at and the key technologies. Horizontal in nature, things like security or reliability, um, different aspects associated with trust. And you can see here now extending that into many other different working groups. And it's not just within the working groups, it's actually the cross collaboration that we're able to accomplish. And that's this consortium is member driven, highly innovative, highly collaborative. And as I said, moving from that conceptual stage and the foundational elements to the actual demonstration of the value. And we have many different um, deliverables, activities. If you haven't seen our website, I highly encourage you to go to our website, take a look at a lot of the information that's there, and we continue to build these out uh, as we progress, whether it's the frameworks, whether it's toolkits to be able to help and guide in starting your journey of a digital twin, or bringing out innovations through our technology spotlight, which serves to really become more of a incubator or a generator for use cases and case studies, talking about the value. And so what I'm gonna go into here is some of the key areas that we have relative to the manufacturing. So um, this is from one of our members. One of the key points here is harsh environment, low latency, and very high fidelity in terms of the use cases. We have a collection of our technology showcase, which are use cases and reference, uh, a reference library of use cases and case studies demonstrating the value a digital twin provides 
at different phases of the life cycle of a digital twin. Here you can see 16. We're rolling this out now. We have by the end of this uh, end of this month, we expect to have at least half a dozen more added into this, and several of these will be are already being published onto our website under our technology showcase, which is that reference library of these uh, use cases. Here you can see the current use cases. Um, there's four of these that we're uh, in process of publishing. Two of them are public right now. Uh, more are coming every week. And one of the ones I wanted to highlight, since we are talking about 5G, we are talking about manufacturing, is this is uh, from one of our regional branch organizers. This is based in Spain. This is a think tank uh, called Bicom Tech. And here you can see it was all about quality control. And so looking at that, being able to bring Digital Twin into these legacy manufacturing processes and bring it into an area where you could have remote operation and remote control and visibility from that standpoint. So if we look at that, look at the solution, the system to be able to go from the um, manufacturing execution system all the way through the ERP, but having a remote operator being able to look at the parts that are coming through this high speed pick in place with the Cobot Assist, to then be able to stop and over 5G be able to look at that in their virtual environment, identify, pick up the object, and then identify where some of the issues were Again, looking at it from quality control, and then if necessary, going back and retraining, because this is using uh, neural networks for this, as well as machine learning, and being able to now retrain and then start that system back up. And again, without having the operator in place, this is actually uh, being uh, validated right now in, uh, in an airport and a couple other different uh, production facilities. So you can see here the role of the digital twin, Looking at this, being able to provide this quality control infrastructure here, you can see virtual reality from the inspection point of view, the machine learning, and then looking at some of the values that are um, uh, related from that. Another example is looking at it from a carbon reporting, and you'll be seeing this uh, use case coming up very soon. So um, onto the technology showcase. Um, so here you can see, again, Digital Twin being able to provide this standardized data model for the carbon reporting and understanding that and being able to look at that across the entire uh, value chain throughout the production. Another example is for precision control, where the digital twin is actually involved in understanding where the uh, uh, anomalies may be occurring through this high precision uh, laser doing the annealing on the system. And so um, while this is going on, it's high speed thermographic analysis, you can see the digital twin being able to look at this in parallel with as the laser is there, when it detects the uh, differences, it's able to identify this as a potential anomaly and then go back and know that that part is not 100% uh, to spec. Another example, and these are all member examples within the consortium. Another example here is doing predictive quality uh, and again, needing that low latency uh, and the process control. This is for uh, essentially having ensuring first pass yield in this plastic film uh, manufacturing environment. Again, needing to have that digital twin to be able to look at this, analyze that, provide that uh, ability for a increased first pass yield. And this goes across the entire supply chain. If you think about it, the value that digital twin is providing is looking and understanding and being able to have set points or thresholds where you can have advanced alerts and know that you're reaching to some point where either the anomalous behavior may occur or there could be some type of a failure resulting in unplanned downtime, which cascades and ripples through the entire supply chain as we've seen. And think about that from the perspective of going from reactive to more predictive to then that end-to-end -end digital twin providing that prescriptive and then reaching finally this stage towards autonomous operation. And now you can bring in digital twins autonomously communicating between themselves with very little uh, man in the middle um, uh, intervention. We're not at that point yet, we're getting to that. That's uh, as we continue through the evolution of the digital twin. This is actually part of the advent of what the founder of the concept of the digital twin states as the um, the intelligent digital twin, where you're able to have the digital twin running faster than real time, 
this front running simulation uh, and move forward. And that's Dr. Michael Greaves and uh, his, his uh, paper that's just been released around or released a couple months ago around this evolution of a digital twin, what we're seeing and where this is progressing and how Dan, AI Dan. and machine learning are advancing. Dan, sorry to interrupt. Let, let, can we just, can we stop it there and maybe yeah. bring, up, and, and bring up some of this? Uh, I mean, that's a, that's a good kind of futuristic uh, 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 slide you've got there of, of the way this goes. I think if we can, we'll, dr we'll draw the, uh, your uh, segment to a close uh, now, just to give, make sure Simon's got time uh, and we've got time for a few questions at the end, if that's okay. Perfect. No, that's a great stopping point. I just had one more slide, but that's that's a fine fine area to, uh, to stop. Okay. Yeah. okay. Look, uh, Dan, that's fantastic stuff. Um, Simon, um, uh, if you uh, can queue up your screen, that would be great. Dan, stop sh uh, sharing yours. That's great. Um, and so, yes, so I'd like to introduce Simon Frumpkin again, CEO at Freshwave Group, uh, which is, he'll explain, a UK-based, uh, fairly new kind of infrastructure, uh, shared infrastructure provider, uh, offering private networks, new, neutral host infrastructure, this kind of stuff. Uh, Simon, I will hand over to you. Great to have you with us. Um, and I will turn off my camera and join you again at 15. It's all your side. Thanks, James. Can you see the screen? Yeah, I can. That looks great. Right. OK. Thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, great privilege to be here to, um, to, to give this short presentation. What I'm going to talk about is a project we've done to uh, connect station maintenance um, using a digital twin at... St Pancras International um, Station in the centre of London. Um, just a little bit about Freshwave first. So um, I'm the CEO of the business. I've been here for three years. As, as James mentioned, we're a relatively um, new business, but actually made up of a, a number of sort of forerunner businesses that we acquired with a, with a very, very strong heritage in highly technical radio um, network design um, for mo principally for mobile telecoms operators. Um, and you can see here everything we do. So we don't just focus on mobile private networks for digital twins. We have a, a very broad um, product offering, which encompasses uh, Wi-Fi, um, indoor coverage solutions for enterprise and public sector. And also we do a lot of work with the telecoms operators, providing them with mass and outdoor small cell infrastructure. Um, we, uh, we, 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 we talk about... Um, connecting our customers' customers. So we're a B2B rather than a B2C business. That means um, that we're, we're providing solutions generally for enterprises or telecoms operators or uh, public sector organizations to make sure that their customers are connected. Um, and you can see on this slide, a very small um, selection of, of, of some of the customers we work with, um, ranging from blue chip to telecoms, as I say, uh, and, and, and many, many large properties in London. Um, I'll drill down on the mobile private network projects that we've done, the, the, the most interesting ones, because um, this is very much the enabler for Digital Twin uh, that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so uh, we, we've, uh, we've, we've implemented quite a few live mobile private networks for different use cases. Um, so uh, examples here, so we, we put in place a um, a mobile private network at a food processing factory covering all the indoor and outdoor areas of the factory. Watch that. What that means is that um, they have much more flexibility to move around the, uh, the, the machinery and the, um, the, the, the different equipment that they use in that, um, in, in that installation, uh, which, which previ previously was, was, was cabled in. So um, operationally, that provides them with a lot of efficiency. Um, we worked with a bio innovation center, um, working on a number of different use cases um, for them. Uh, that's, a, that's a 5G core uh, uh, private network uh, with very, very fast speeds, very, very high levels of latency and reliability uh, that you need for uh, that type of application. Um, then um, uh, an innovation center um, where we, uh, we, we provided what, what's quite um, uh, innovative and, and, and new what's called 5G standalone. Um, so this is a sort of pure 5G, not dependent on, on 4G for, um, for, for, for location and um, um, for, for processing user data. Um, and, and that's a network that works indoors and outdoors and, and, and opens up a whole load of technology, uh, wayfinding, virtual assistance, smart parking, 
um, all sorts of things that you can do if you're indoors and outdoors. Um, uh, commercial application accelerator, um, and then and then um, we've we've won uh, quite a few awards for our solutions for uh, rural uh, private networks, in particular for holiday parks, um, which are which are notoriously very very difficult for um, for mobile operators to connect in an efficient way, and also very difficult to cover for Wi-Fi. The, the only reason I mention that I know this is. Um, uh, this this conference is is um, is primarily direct to the manufacturing industry, but any of you that have um, relatively remote um, uh, locations that, that you're trying to cover and, and, and are struggling to cover, they could be offshore, um, they could be uh, they, they could be in rural or quite remote locations where you where you're struggling to uh, to cover those sorts of areas. We've we've got really really good solutions for. Um, for, for, for difficult to cover rural areas where, 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 as I say, we've won a number of awards. So that's the sort of background to our, um, our the, 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 the type of sort of scale and variety of our private networks. Um, St Pancras I'm going to talk to you about in the digital twin example there is a, um, it's, it's a, it's a consortium funded by Innovate UK um, in, in the UK, a uh, consortium of, 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 business, uh, of businesses and organisations you can see um, at the bottom here, um, but but all designed to um, to deliver into our customer network rail um, a number of different use cases for them, ranging from full diagnosis, um, helping them to understand data, but also helping them to understand passenger flows. A um, little bit more about the the, the the project. So what we were able to do um, was um, was provide complete remote monitoring. Um, in, in very complex and, as you can imagine, very difficult to uh, to, to to access locations, including trackside, where you know for health and safety, it's, it, it's very difficult to um, access the actual locations that that maintenance people might want to. Um, it gives us because of the, the 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 very high reliability and latency of the private network, very very high um, uh, levels of, of of accuracy and data. Um, enables forecasting passenger flows um, and, and, and really allowed our customer to drill down on, on customer experience. Um, and you can, you can see that um, the, it's, a, it's a very, very um, high footfall area. So, uh, so actually 40,000 passengers and staff using the lifts and escalators in, in that station every day. So I'm just going to show you a very short video um, from our customer now explaining what they, uh, what, what they managed to do um, with this, uh, with this digital twin and this private network. HS1 is all about customers and customer service. And what a digital twin allows us to do is to be able to monitor our assets. And that allows us to ensure that our customer service is exemplary. Giving our customers a hassle-free journey, having assets available like lifts and escalators, but also reliable train service, means customers can have a good experience and be confident that when they travel on our network, it will be reliable and it will be safe. As engineering director for High Speed One, the digital twin is, is really important for us and it actually shows how we're bringing live asset data right to the point of need where the technicians need it and where the operations staff need it and actually tying in what's happening on the operational railway to our station assets, which we've never done before. So what's been really good from this phase of the project is really being able to test the use cases for the, for the technology and being able to put it in front of the guys and girls that are going to be actually using the, uh, using the technology on the front line. This technology is the way forward in a training format. It's a safe environment you can set up very simply. And so for an individual, as in the individuals that are behind me, one of them has never seen the equipment that he is going through at the moment. So therefore, as an introduction to our assets and to our equipment, it is the ideal format for us to bring staff in working with something and having a full introduction of how the equipment works that you're looking at and going through the steps with, ready for when you go to the next stage, which will be physically working on the equipment. So it gives the individuals a true understanding of the assets that they will be looking to maintain or replace in the future. HS1 is a very unique organisation. We're agile, we can make decisions quickly, and that enables us to be at the forefront of technology. We can be the test bed for the rest of the network, and we're proud to be doing that 
on a number of the innovations that we're looking at currently. So hopefully that gives you a, 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 a quick um, snapshot and a sense of what we were doing with this digital twin and, and the benefits that it gave to our customer network rail. Um, I'll, I'll move on just to explain what our role was in, in delivering this. And as I say, very much um, focused on delivering the mobile private network infrastructure. So that's a private network uh, on, on a 5G technology, um, <clears throat> which enables the digital twin um, to, to operate um, at the level of performance it needs to. <clears throat> so from our perspective, um, we deliver the radio coverage plan. Um, we build the network. <coughs> and um, we, we, um, we integrated the core network and provided operation support uh, with Athernet, um, who are our partner on the core network. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in terms of benefits, um, as you, you've seen already, the, uh, the, the, the network demonstrated the unique capabilities of this, um, this digital twin platform. Um, the, the mobile private network is essential to that. So I don't think uh, there's any way that a digital twin of this complexity could be delivered on any legacy technology. Really, um, 5G private network is, is, is almost certainly the only um, type of wireless network it could be, um, it, it could be um, operated on. Uh, and Wi-Fi in that sort of environment just has way too much interference. Um, and it's just not nearly reliable enough or or, um, or, or has the, the right level of latency. Um, and, and security is essential. So the, the other benefit, a huge benefit of, of a 4G or 5G private network is the physical SIM security rather than the sort of Wi-Fi um, password or code um, security, which, which we're all familiar with. So just drilling down very quickly um, to finish off on, on mobile private networks and what they are. Um, so. To, to try to explain in this slide what a mobile private network is. Um, in essence, um, think of it as the best of both worlds. Um, the, 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 the benefit of control that you have in a Wi-Fi network in your own premises um, <coughs> for your own employees or customers, um, but coupled with the, the technology benefits that a national mobile network has in terms of 4G, 5G. What that means is that a mobile private network on licensed spectrum without contention or interference and with SIM-based access um, really gives you the best of both worlds um, in, in, in terms of you know, what, what I would term the most reliable and secure possible connectivity. Um, that's why other people are, as well as Network Rail and, and many of our customers are in, investing in mobile private networks, um, really three takeaways for you about why you would build a mobile private network. It's more reliable um, in terms of speeds and latency. Uh, it's more secure, um, both in terms of the end-to-end -end encryption and the SIM-based security that you get. Um, and it's, it, it's much more simple to deploy um, than, than, than other alternative technologies. So um, in summary, I hope, hope that gives you a, a, an impression of both the digital tech digital twin technology that we that we implemented with our partners um, and importantly the mobile private network uh, technology that is essential as a um, as a facilitating technology to deliver this thank you sam yeah. that that's fantastic really really good intro there, intro there so thank you for that so um dan if you if you put your camera back on we'll have uh, we've got um 10 minutes or so for for some questions I guess Simon, just to start with, just just clarify that network rail piece at, at St Pancras. Was that a uh, a five G private five G installation, or was it at, in fact an LTE based? Uh, project? No, it was a it was a it was a five G installation. So we we tend to um, design our private networks in a very bespoke way, and we use the technology and the vendors that that are required for the type of latency, reliability, security that they're going to need. Um, so, for example, in the in the, in the in the case of the rural example I gave you, um, you know, in that case it was it was reliable, but 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 um, economic um, uh, deployment of, of connectivity that was required in that case, the so 4G was perfectly good enough. In this case, where you're talking about 
um, a digital twin in, in, a, in a very crowded environment um, where you need, you know, extremely low latency, very reliable um, data. And, and, and there's obviously a huge amount of data involved in, in the digital twin um, visualization. Um, 5G was absolutely essential. And Dan, just just to just to put that through the digital twin kind of mixer, if you like. I mean, you know, the five G thing and what it means. You're, you were talking earlier about um, you know hyper connected to hyper automated, which I liked. It's a, a you know nice turn of phrase. Um, and you had uh, various um, use cases you, you presented on precision control, predictive quality, which is kind of I guess a little more familiar carbon reporting, some of this kind of stuff. Are those all digital twins, which in those cases hinged on a 5G connection or were they, I mean, because presumably 5G is, I mean, clearly 5G is just a, it amps all this up. But I mean, in those cases, which were effective digital twin models, was 5G required or was that in fact something else? I think it's it gets back to what uh, Simon was talking about, right? You had the reliability, you have the security and you have the deployment. And I think in, in some cases, yes, there could be alternatives used, but I think that the 5G provides the advantage and initial prove out to validate that this is something that's feasible and can actually be, uh, be deployed at scale. So I, I would say it's a combination, really. Okay. And, and Simon, I guess, I guess from a manufacturing point of view, as you engage with the manufacturing sector, is that typically start as a 5G discussion? I mean, the, the, the sense is, uh, you know, that you have a, at least a couple of cellular technologies in play here, one with a very kind of developed ecosystem of devices and this kind of stuff. And, and you know, uh, it's, it's kind of mass market, the, the cost and affordability is there and something else which is newer, uh, less well known, and perhaps at the, at the moment offers uh, an advantage, but not the advantage that it will do uh, you know, in, in yeah. months and years down the line. So just what is it? How does that conversation go? If, if I'm an enterprise coming to you and I'm a manufacturing enterprise with kind of high, fid high fidelity kind of production lines, this kind of stuff, does it immediately shift to a 5G conversation or does it tend to be actually an LTE conversation to start with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, not not necessarily 5G straight away. I mean, you know, from, from, from our perspective, we don't really want, you know, we're the technology solution provider. We don't really want our customers... To, to, to be worried about the, you know, what G it is or what, what you know, what, what type of network. Um, it starts with the use cases and the discussion about what they want to use the network for, um, what the requirements are, you know, how difficult the, the, the space is, the terrain. You know, I tried to contrast, for example, um, you know, the difference between, a, you know, very rural space with, a, you know, highly congested central London station. And we, we obviously have everything in between. So it really depends on all, all, all sorts of factors in terms of what the right recommendation for technology is. But, but as, you, as you said, you know, from an affordability perspective, um, if 4G is good enough, um, that's great because the, um, the availability and cost of 4G devices right now is significantly lower than 5G. That, that won't be the case. I think in two, three years time, we'll see the, 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 the 5G device costs come down. But for now, obviously, if, if 4G is good enough, and in many, many cases, 4G is absolutely fine, um, then, then we'll recommend a, a 4G implementation. Uh, also, it's, it's, it's worth saying, you know, as with most technologies, this technology is upgradable. So many of our customers will start with 4G and will upgrade them to 5G, um, you know, a, a, as and when the, the cost points and, and the technology is right. And so I'm just, just, just on, on the kind of private network thing and how the, uh, you know, the, the, the discussions go and how the, and partnerships are made and this kind of stuff just yeah. in the manufacturing space i mean you you know fresh wave group is is clearly positioning itself as a as a you know where, where the operator traditional operators the public network operators are are customers and also partners for for you uh, in the supply of this kind of stuff just you know because it, it gets talked about you know the role of operators in private networks and specifically in manufacturing and just is it i'd be interested to hear your point of view on their role and, and specifically, you know, how you're seeing the kind of interest from MNOs in the manufacturing space mm. at the moment, how, how articulate they are, how well uh, versed they are in this kind of vertical domain, and also, you know, in the interest in MNOs from manufacturing companies. What, what's the what's your take on yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, look, my, um, I mean, look, I, I, I start the answer to that question by, um, 
by giving you my background, which is 20 years working in the in the M and O industry, James. So, um, look, it, it's it's a um, it's an industry I know very very well. Um, we don't compete um, head to head with mobile operators. There are partners, there are customers, um, and and you know, in some of the cases I talked about, you know, we we we've worked with them um, to deliver solutions to their customers. So we fit into this um, to this ecosystem and value chain, you know. Uh, where, where we need to fit in, but we're absolutely not competing with the mobile operators um, in, in terms of, you know, the, their customers. And they have many, many um, relationships with large manufacturing customers, which we support them with. It really comes down to, you know, where we can add value, whether it's the, 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 the technical design side, the operations, um, but also financing the infrastructure is very important. And we're, um, we're, we're, we're owned by um, a large infrastructure fund in the U.S., um, who who are extremely interested and focused on in investing in this type of infrastructure. So you know the, the investment side and, and and the capital cost is also something that we're very focused on. Right, gotcha. Okay, and Dan, just to bring back uh, bring you back in on, on this discussion, mm -hmm. you 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 kind of um, you you showed your use case library. You've got a number in there. It's a developing kind of portfolio, obviously, um, and you kind of uh, characterise the digital twin market as as kind of approaching some kind of maturity, almost or or near maturity. I can't remember quite what the phrase was, but just I mean, clearly there's a there's a lot of road to run, and there is you know talk about. A uh, you know an industrial metaverse and this kind of stuff. Just just explain to me where we're going with this hyper automation and what that even means because this is not a a Facebook style kind of metaverse, is it? This is just I mean it strikes me it's not. It's something which is somehow tethered in reality. Just just yeah just, it, exactly. Just talk me and, that. and that's that's really what we're seeing. Um, you know, being manifested first is is what's called the the enterprise or industrial metaverse. And we've seen different announcements from major companies about uh, how that's being uh, looked at and being deployed. And it really is, to your point, you know, steeped in reality. It's based, it's physics based. The laws of physics, the laws of nature have to have to apply. And, um, you know, we're starting to see this in different areas. There was just a, a major uh, conference, actually, or trade show uh, last week, PAC Expo in Chicago. And I was talking with uh, with a company that is looking at delivering digital twins to companies that are already building out and and looking at how they can actually lay out their factory in, in a way. And so this was a packaging company and say they could actually deliver the digital twin and the model, but it's physics based. So it's actually it's representative and it's using uh, virtual sensors, bringing in real data to be able to show that operation. And I think that's where we're starting to see that come across, at least in that area of enterprise uh, metaverse or industrial metaverse. And, and one other point, I, I saw there's a question in the chat here, and, and that's exactly, it, it's right online in terms of what a digital twin enables, right? The digital twin enables you to have this closed loop path where you can identify these anomalies in real time and then take actions based on the analysis of that data and feed that back into the, the, uh, the real world or the physical from a, a operational standpoint, control standpoint, to ensure that you don't have a, uh, a catastrophic failure or that you can minimize the effect that that anomaly that you've detected has been there. So you do get this closed loop effect. And that's again, back to the industrial metaverse or enterprise metaverse is the digital twin is bridging from that physical from that reality to the virtual. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And so I'm just on that this this idea that you know that with the with a with the kind of digital twin, twin implementation at, at St Pancras with HS1, you know, uh, the question of whether it's a it's a kind of a, a, a you know a closed loop uh, response or it's a prompt for a, a you know human intervention to somebody to intercede and kind of come in and and, and put yeah. right. I thought presumably it's the latter, but just I mean, put me right there. Is it, on what's going on there in some? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's um, it, it, it is it is primarily the latter, James. I, I mean, the, the the caveat would be um, it, in that type of environment. Obviously, human intervention is not always you know practically possible, um, and so I think a lot of the time um, you're you're identifying issues which. You know, might then be be fixed overnight, or, or you know, at, at, a, at a time where you don't have to 
um, disrupt operations. Um, so maybe, maybe probably the answer is somewhere in between. Yeah. Okay. And Dan, just I mean, we I think when we spoke before or we spoke previously, we we talked a little bit about you know the the challenge to scale and the with digital twins and you know the you know the issues with interoperability which is just an industrial IoT problem really but but you know um and also the kind of vision of a metaverse or industrial metaverse and, and the reality of of going in and and putting something to work in the in the first instance just i think you said previously there was a, there was you know people make a mistake of kind of starting with the data or starting with perhaps kind of a too too narrow kind of implementation mm -hmm. almost that the the message is almost that you have to you have to start small but think big you know uh, right. you know just is that right is that is that the is that the kind of advice with with this kind of stuff from you yeah what we found um and, and this was based on uh some of our members working directly with customers where they were looking to understand uh you know it's a multidisciplinary company they have different regions uh where they're engineers are working on one aspect of either artificial intelligence or machine learning or looking at how they can actually do some of the modeling, these different aspects. And what they were looking for was a way to sort of unify that entire approach. And what came out of this discussion was to look at it in terms of uh, back to the concept of the jobs to be done. What, what job are you hiring the digital twin for? And then don't look at the data, don't look come into an architecture implementation, not right away, but look at it in terms of what are the capabilities that are necessary to accomplish that. Uh, that job. And again, look at low hanging fruit, right? Understand what is what is that core area? What is that um, that top priority you have? And then understanding that objective, look at the capabilities, map those capabilities out. So you understand then from what are the what are the core technologies or the the optimal technologies? You may not need a neural network. Machine learning may be some, may be adequate, or a dashboard may may be adequate. But look at it from that concept. And the way they structured this was in a very familiar manner, and that was using a periodic table. So replace the elements with these capabilities. That gives you that superset, and then be able to map that back and say, okay, these are the technologies that will accomplish this. These are the optimal technologies, and then look at that and say, do I have the appropriate data source? Do I have the data I need? Can I enrich it with synthetic data? that will ensure I have a higher level of precision or accuracy if I have gaps in that, and then bring that forward. And so this is a actual um, result of work product that's coming out of the Digital Twin Consortium and creating this entire workflow, which gets back into the convergence of the ITOT. What does the platform stack look like? What are these areas? So that's a toolkit that we have released. We're working on the second phase of that, actually. Uh, we've had members that, believe it or not, that, have joined Dan, because of that. Dan, so I'm going to Dan, I'm going to interrupt and stop you again, and I and with, with apologies, and just say, no, no problem. Let's let's chat again. Let's have this conversation again. Both 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 of you, thanks so much for your time, and I'm sorry I uh, we didn't we didn't get to more questions. There's a lot to talk about. It's a really interesting topic. Absolutely, uh, both the private networks and the digital twin thing. But look, thank you so much for your time. I think we've got a couple more sessions going today, um, and right now, in literally 60 seconds or so, we've got one starting on <laughs> warehouse automation with. Intel and Aaron Dye, and I'm handing uh, chairing duties over to Daniel Beezer from Analysis Mason. But look, that's all from us for now. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Simon. And we'll uh, we'll catch you soon. Thank you. Thanks bye. for the opportunity. Bye bye. Thank you.